I just thank you for this um, amazing time that we have together as a church family, Lord. And Father God, I pray that as I speak your word and what you've laid on my heart, that I speak under the unction of the Holy Spirit. I thank you, Father God, that your word is alive and active and powerful. And I thank you, Father God, that it will go forth and accomplish what it needs to accomplish in the hearts of your people this morning. Lord, I just thank you for an awesome morning. I thank you for your presence with us. I thank you for your peace upon us. I thank you for your encouragement, Lord, to just build up and bubble up in our hearts this morning as we read your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Um, I'm going to be preaching on the power of adoption this morning. And um, I actually sat down and I had this whole other sermon prepared in my mind because I prepare, I think about my sermons in advance quite a lot. And then when I come down to type them, you know, I know the topic. But as I sat down to type, <laughs> I was like, what? This is not where I was going. But I landed up on um, the Holy Spirit leading me to talk about the power of adoption and the power of being in the family of God. And, you know, we, we, this is a faith church. You know, we believe in moving in the prophetic and the gifts of the Spirit. We believe in the end times um, and the move of God that is going to take place. And so we teach a lot about those things, but we also just teach a lot of um, family topics. When I say family topics, I mean topics that pertain to you being part of the body of Christ. You being part of the family of God. What does it mean to be part of the family of God when you are a member of a church? Sometimes in church life, we don't realize that when we are part of a family, there are family ways of doing things. There are family ways of not doing things. And sometimes being in church life, we don't understand the protocols and procedures of what it means to be in the family of God. And it's not protocols and procedures, but if you just think of any natural family, everyone has a role in the family, in the household. When you have children, you actually start to put a little bit of responsibility on them when the time is right to pick up their responsibility within that family so that not only one person is carrying the load, but that's a shared load. So that it's, you teach them responsibilities. So the first thing I'm teaching my kids, women and I are teaching our kids, is you've got to tidy your room sometimes. Ah, <laughs> oh, mom, I hate it. <laughs> but when you finish your dinner, I want you to take your plate and I want you to put it near the sink. And as your kids get older, you give them more and more responsibility. Because as you train them with responsibilities in the home, they become more independent, reliable adults out there in the world. They don't become spoiled brats, <laughs> entitled, lazy. The things you teach at home help them to become good members of society. And so the things of being part of a church is actually things you have to do to be part of a local church. There are things that um, are important for you to pick up and realize that are your responsibility so that you actually contribute to the family of God. So I'll move into that a bit later, but I wanted to first talk about something really important that was laid on my heart and something I've thought about a lot over the years, and that is adoption. So I've got to tell you a little story, a family story. In 1948, in Glasgow, Scotland, my dad was born. Yes, some Glaswegians in the house. <laughs> and um, when my dad was born, he was actually uh, left at the hospital and he was abandoned as a child. He was, he was left there. So I don't know if you call it put up for adoption, but he was in the hospital for, I think, about 10 days. And so that was where he was. And um, there happened to be a couple um, who had given birth to a child. Unfortunately, that child didn't survive the birth. It was very traumatic. It was a home birth. Back in those days, you'd get the local midwife to come. And my grandmother, who became my grandmother, she said she, felt she could smell alcohol on her breath. So the midwife that came probably wasn't all quite there. <laughs> and so things didn't go right. And so she, they lost a child. And so the doctor who had brought my dad into the world also knew about the Ingalls family. And so he called Femi. He said, Femi and John, there is a baby here at the hospital. 
We want you to, I want you to come and see this baby. Just, just come and have a look. I know you, you need to take a child. You need to adopt some, a child because if you don't, I'm worried about how you're going to go. No, no, we want a girl. We want a girl. We lost a girl. We want a girl. So she didn't come the first time. But this doctor persisted. So he waited a few more days and he called her again. He said, Femi, her name's Femi. Femi Ingalls, come down to the hospital, please. Just, just have a look at this little baby boy. He's beautiful. So reluctantly, her and my grandfather, the Ingalls family, came down to the hospital and she picked up my dad and she said she fell in love with him the minute she picked him up. It was just this. And so they adopted my dad and he became Tom Ingalls. Um, they named him, they took him home, they introduced him to their family and they raised him as their own. They understood the power of adoption because my grandfather came from a family of, I think it was 13 children. In Scotland, they had a lot of kids. <laughs> and they adopted the 14th child, okay? Adopted the 14th child. And so he understood adoption is a necessary part of life sometimes because life is hard. Things happen. But he understood that it was possible, that it was something that his parents had done and they only had one child. So they adopted my dad. He came, he grew, he grew up with them. They became 10-pound palms. And they had two uh, application forms. One was for Australia, one was for South Africa. South Africa came back first saying, yes, you can come. So they went to South Africa. And my dad was 15. Long story short, he grew up there. He met my beautiful mom. And life, life happened. We came along. Landed up moving here to Australia to start a work, to be in the ministry. But the power of adoption, adoption has been a really um, powerful story in all of our lives. Because what happens if they didn't adopt him? What, what would have happened? You just don't know. You don't know where he would have landed up. He, he might have been with a great family. He might have been with a terrible. We, we don't know. There were orphanages in Scotland. He could have gone to one of those. So we understand the power of adoption. And when you think about the power of adoption, sometimes children who are adopted feel like they're not, um, because they're not the natural born child, maybe they're not as special, but it actually is completely the other way around. They've been chosen and they were longed for and they were purposefully sought out. And I just think it's, it's something that's it really impacted me. I found out my dad was adopted when I was about, was about 10, wasn't I, mom? Maybe young, I think I was younger. And I always thought, I love my granny and grandpa so much. They're amazing. But I always thought, wow, I've got another granny out there. I hope she's all right. I hope she's okay. So we prayed for her. But um, I've, I was very blessed to have very uh, Glaswegian <laughs> grandparents who spoke a lot of confidence into my life as a very young child. And um, they were very upfront with my dad right from the beginning. We chose you. You're not born of ours, but you are ours. You are my son, you know. And so it was the most amazing story. But when we look at the Gospels, something that really struck me was that the adoption story is a massive theme running throughout the Bible. They're actually some of the greatest biblical, um, you know, names that we know of our heroes. A lot of them were adopted. So um, Samuel was adopted by Eli, the priest, Samuel was brought to the temple and given um, as, um, by his mother to the temple to serve God because God had given her this special child. And so at the right time, Eli adopted him as a father. Moses was adopted by Pharaoh's household. He was adopted into a royal household. He was found in a basket floating down a river. Adopted. He was raised as an Egyptian prince with every, um, with every privilege and everything that an Egyptian prince would have, Moses was given. He was brought into the family. Esther, who saved the people of Israel from slaughter, she was adopted by Mordecai. When you look at the scriptures, Mordecai was actually her older cousin, a lot older. He was married and he adopted her and raised her. And this is a huge one. Jesus was adopted by Joseph. Joseph and Mary, Joseph didn't, wasn't part of the conception of Jesus. So when the angel appeared to him, 
He had a decision to make. What am I going to do? He adopted Jesus. He raised him. He loved him as his own. And so the power of adoption, if even Jesus was adopted, is something about that, isn't it? And I think that it mirrors the fact that we have all been adopted. When we look, uh, let's look at our Bibles. I wanted to talk about when you come to become a Christian, you are called born again. How many times do we throw that, that like word around? Are you born again? Yes, I'm born again. What does it mean? Born again is to be born a second time. To be born anew. To be born afresh. When you are born again, when you have lived a life without Jesus, and then you come into the family of God, you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, from that day, it's almost like you press a reset button on your life. Beep. It says in the Word, this is how powerful coming into the family, family of God is. Where is my scripture? That we are new creations in Christ. Okay, here it is. In 2 Corinthians 5.17, it says, Therefore, if any person is engrafted in Christ, he is a new creation, a new creature altogether. The old previous moral and spiritual condition has passed away, and behold, fresh, the fresh and new has come. When we come into the body of Christ, I was born and into a Christian family, and so I, I didn't have that massive conversion experience, but I had other experiences with the presence and the Spirit of God that really solidified my faith. But if you are living out in the world and, and you're lost, because I sometimes think, whoa, who would I be without God? Oh my gosh, I don't even want to know. I know my weaknesses. I know my failures. Who would I be? But if you have lived a life without Jesus and you come into living a life with Jesus, isn't it wonderful to think I get to press a reset button? All of the moral and spiritual condition that I had before is washed away. And I now am a new creation in Christ. But how does that happen? How are you a new creation in Christ? Well, you've been adopted and born into a new family, into the family of God. And so you are part of something much bigger than yourself. When you're out there um, in the world and you don't know God, it's like being an orphan. You're just out there. Orphans go through so much. They feel abandoned. They have nothing to connect and ground them. There is no one to love them and look after them. And they are fighters. They just make their way through life. But when you get saved, you are going through an adoption process. You are adopted into the family of God. And it is one of the most powerful things that can ever take place in your life is the power of adoption. And I think that um, for us to understand our part in the family of God, we have to understand how powerful the adoption process was that we were part of. And I think sometimes people don't realize that. They get born again. They come into a church and they sort of fumble their way into, where do I belong? What, like Maybe I should go to this church, maybe that church. How, how do I do church? What? And so there has to be a process of... Um, of renewal, um, of discipleship that takes place. And so when you get born again, born anew, born afresh, you suddenly have a family where you didn't have one before. How do I behave in a family? I've never been in one before. I don't know I'm meant to clean my room, (laughs) pick up my stuff, take it to the kitchen. Every family has a set or a code of like things that they do in their household to keep their household running well. And it's the same thing when you come into the family of God. What does it mean to be part of, and when I say a family, I'm talking about your local church. How do I become part of the local church? First of all, I just want to talk about adoption before I go into all of that. I haven't made it up. I'm going to read some awesome scriptures for you guys. (laughs) Romans 8, verse 13 to 16. It says, For if you live according to the dictates of the flesh, you will surely die. But if through the power of the Holy Spirit, you are putting to death, making extinct 
deadening the evil deeds prompted by your body, you shall really and genuinely live forever. So what that's talking about is that is the process of transformation that happens from when you become born again, you become a disciple of Jesus, you start to learn how to behave differently, how to think differently, because you are a new creation in Christ. Old things have passed away, all things have become new, and it is a renewal process <clears throat> that you are part of. And so you have this tugging of, well, I used to do things like this, but now I'm doing it like this. And your old friends might not understand. Your family might not understand. Well, why can't you come out and just get smashed with us this weekend? Well, because I'm a new creation in Christ. <clears throat> they won't understand this new life. They won't understand that you pressed a reset button <clears throat> when you came into the family of God. But it says, <clears throat> sorry, for all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For the Spirit which you have now received at your re new birth is not a spirit of slavery, because that's what the world is under. But once more, uh, uh, not, is not a spirit of slavery to put you once more in bondage to fear, but you have received the Spirit of adoption, the Spirit producing sonship which we cry, Abba, Father. Suddenly you can say, I have a Father God because I am now in a family and I have been adopted. I have a Father. Abba is a Hebrew word for Father. Abba, Father. So you basically say Father, Father. <clears throat> there is a process of adoption. In uh, John 1 verse 12, it says, But to as many as did receive and welcome him, he gave the authority, the power, okay, the privilege, the right to become children of God. That is to those who believe in his name. You become a child of God. <clears throat> now, it's interesting that these words were used. He gave the authority to become children of God. There is a spiritual authority that is conferred upon you when you come into the kingdom of God. When you are not living in a relationship with Jesus and you're walking through life, you do not have authority, spiritual authority, over the situations and circumstances you find yourself in because you have not been adopted into the family as soon as you're adopted into the family, that means that you have the rights <clears throat> and the privileges of those who are part of that family. <clears throat> Excuse me. Think about any, any family. The rights and privileges of a family is that you can come and speak to your parents about anything. We should be. Or you can come to them and say, hey, I've done something. I need help. <laughs> it's okay, son. It's okay, daughter. Let's sort this out for you. I'm glad you came to speak to me. Okay, let's sort it out. You have the right and privilege to walk in and open the cupboards and eat whatever you want because you're a child in that house. There is food in the cupboard for you. You have the right and the privilege to have a bed in that home because you are a son or daughter of that house. There are privileges that you have when you come into the kingdom of God and they are spiritual privileges that help you in life, God gives us those spiritual privileges to help establish the kingdom of God on earth. It's helping to establish the authority of Jesus in your town, in your home, in your city, in your nation. Ephesians 1 verse 4 to 5, it says, Even as he chose us, actually picked us out for himself as his own in Christ before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy, consecrated and set apart, and blameless in His sight, even above reproach before Him in love. Those are all things you inherit when you become a Christian. That you are holy and consecrated, you are set apart, blameless in God's sight. Before we have became a Christian, we were living in sin. So we were not blameless. We couldn't be. 
And it says, verse 5, it says, For He foreordained us, He planned for us in love to be adopted as His own children through Jesus Christ in accordance to the purpose of His will because it pleased Him and because of His kind intent. So good. Galatians 4, verse 5 to 7, To purchase the free freedom of those who are subject to the law, that we might be adopted and have sonship conferred upon us and be recognized as God's sons, sons and daughters. And because you really are his sons, God has sent the Holy Spirit to, um, of his son in, into our hearts, crying again, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then... An heir by the aid of God through Christ. So you are not, it's interesting how the Bible talks about those who have not come into relationship with Jesus as a slave. A slave has no rights. They work hard, they're in tough situations. But once you come into the family of God, you move from being a slave to being a son or a daughter. You have privileges and rights spiritually. But most importantly, the greatest privilege we have is eternal life. Eternal life through Jesus. That is the inheritance of the saints. And I think that's so important. It's such a powerful thing to visualize is that now I'm part of a family. I'm part of the family of God. I have all these spiritual, the spiritual inheritance is mine. But how do I outwork that? And that is the experience of discipleship. But it's the experience of coming to church and listening to the Word of God. Letting the Word of God wash over you. Letting it build up like a reserve in your heart. And you learn, oh, this is how, as a son of God, I use my authority in my life. As a son and daughter of God, this is how I overcome fear. This is how I overcome anxiety. This is how I walk in confidence and not feel beaten down. This is how I trust. This is how I love people now. This is how I engage with the world. It's different. And it's such a powerful thing. And so you go through this transformation process. And I think that coming into the family of God is one of the greatest things you'll ever experience. No longer an orphan, no longer a slave, but a son with an inheritance and value. You have something to contribute to the body of Christ. You have something to contribute to the church that you find yourself in. Your church needs you. I'm talking to people out there as well. Your church needs you because your inheritance and what God has created you to be, you bring a value to the body that you find yourself in. And so being part of the family of God also means being part of a local church. You'll hear us talk about this all the time because we really, really believe in the safety and the value of local churches. A lot of people will just follow online and they're Christians and they're amazing people but they haven't plugged into a local church. It's so important to plug into a local church because as I said before, in the body of Christ, there is such encouragement in the group of believers, but there's safety and spiritual covering from the pastors of that church over your life. We take it really seriously when we have people in our church. We pray for you. We think about you. The prayer team lifts up needs. If you guys let us know you have, there is, a, there is an exchange that happens within a church. You're part of the body, but you also have covering, protection. Doctrinally, if you have questions, you can ask your questions. And we can talk about them and stay within the grounding of the word. Because when you're out there and you're listening to like so many different people online, who do you talk to about something you've heard that you're not sure about? I'm not sure about that teaching. It pricked me the first time, pricked my conscience. Second time around, oh, they must be right. Oh, yeah, it's fine. Then you hear it a third time from the same preacher. Meantime, it's off. 
you know what it says? Like, <laughs> as a pastor, we very we value all the teaching and stuff that there is online. Heck, we're online too. <laughs> I'm online right now. But you have got to be in a church family with solid Christians so that if you have questions, you can ask them. Ask your pastor. Ask your pastor to pray for you. Ask the pastoral team. Be a part of the body of Christ. Don't just be a partaker. Don't just come to church and have the mentality of feed me, feed me, feed me. I'm here to be fed and I need, need, need. It's more like, well, I'm in a family. Imagine if my kids acted like that in our house. But they never learned manners. They never contributed to like the family in any way. They just left mess everywhere, wasted food, made a ruckus when we were out, embarrassed us. <laughs> when you're part of a family, you have to contribute something. So when you come into the family of God, yes, you must grow spiritually and you're fed. And, but there comes a point where you go, I am part of this family. How do I contribute? How do I build the kingdom? You're building the kingdom out there, obviously, just being who you are in your workplace. You carry the presence of God. Hopefully, you act and speak as a representative of the kingdom. But you also are part of a church family. So what does it mean? It says in 1 Timothy 5, verse 1 to 3, it says, Do not sharply censure or rebuke an older man, but entreat and plead with him as you would a father. So in this scripture, he's talking about how you treat others in your church family. Older men, you treat them as fathers. Treat younger men like brothers. Treat older women like mothers and younger women like sisters. And here is the thing, in all purity. We have a responsibility in our relationships to each other to engage with each other in purity, not for our own self-gain, but also with levels of respect and honor. The young honor the old, the old honor the young. The rest of this is a really important scripture, and it talks about obligations of your earthly family to look after um, if you have a widow in your family, if your mom or dad is a widow or widower, read 1 Timothy 5. Read the whole chapter. It's incredible. I actually taught, said, Vim, like, I said to him, look at this. There is so much uh, in this about how to treat family members as they age. And I think that's very important because I'm, I'm seeing a lot of families abandon each other for whatever reason. But God has given us some guidelines. So I won't go there now, but it's really important. But what is your obligation in your church family? So this is a very practical sermon. I've explained how you come into the body of Christ. I've explained the power of adoption. But what is your obligation to the church that you decide, this is going to be my church home? The first one is take ownership. Say, this is my church. Take ownership of the fact that you are a member. Be open to grow and change as an individual. So obviously you are. If you're coming to church and you're listening to the Word of God, you can't help but change. If you're actually taking it in, you will grow. You will change. You can't not. Come to church regularly and be present because your presence means something to the people around you. Your presence means something. There is something that someone you can give someone that only you can give them. It could just be a chat afterwards with a cup of coffee, an encouraging word. God might say to you, hey, I want you to encourage this person with a prophetic word. And you might have something very small to say, but it could change the trajectory of that week for them. Pitch in and serve in your local church. Be a part of the family. There's nothing like serving. If you don't really know anyone in your church, Vim and I talk about this all the time, the best thing you can do is join a team. And you get to know people. And then it's not so awkward when you're at coffee time and you don't know who to talk to. <laughs> join and make an effort to speak to others you don't know. The other thing is pray for your church. Pray for your leaders. Pray for the pastors. 
who are running different departments. Pray for the children's church. Pray for them. Lift them up. One of the other things that's really important is just walk lightly. If you've been in church a long time, you'll understand what this means. It says be ready to forgive and just refuse offense. Just refuse it. Say, you know what? I'm just not going to be one of those people who are offended left, right, and center. People who have a spirit of offense will be offended by their own shadow. They will be offended if you sneeze wrong, if you park your car in the wrong place. Oh, she's sitting near my chair. Oh. Offense. What the heck? Chuck it out. Now, obviously, offense is, can be much more big things, but if you just go, you know, I refuse to be that person. I'm just going to refuse offense. You are walking lightly and you are walking with forgiveness. And you know what? Your walk is going to be light, lighter than if you were carrying things that people had hurt you and done things to you. It is a process. It's not easy, but the more you practice it, the easier it becomes. The lighter the walk becomes, the lighter the load. And refuse gossip. Refuse gossip. Any pastor will tell you gossip is the cancer of a church. If you don't know the full story, don't add to the story. Don't jump in on the story. Don't carry on the story to someone else. If you don't know, say nothing. And if you don't know, actually say, well, I'm not comfortable with this conversation. Hey, let's talk about something else. How we to change the subject. Gossip. Gossip can go around in circles over churches for years. And, you know, there's a there's an a really I should have got that scripture, I just thought of it now. But it talks about how you are responsible for the words you speak about other people. God hears those words. He's not deaf. He hears what you say about others. And if what you're saying about them is slanderous, if it's breaking down um, their marriage, oh my gosh, just look what happened this week with Princess, um, with Catherine. There were so many crazy things going on about her marriage, her life. There's conspiracy theories. Oh, she's, she's actually like gone away somewhere. The poor woman, that is a spirit of gossip. And it is rife in our media, especially the UK, especially. That is a divisive spirit that tears people apart. It stabs them in the back and walks away and lets them bleed slowly. Gossip is a powerful spiritual force. And when you understand it as not just chatting, it's a spiritual force you understand the kind of sin that you're entering into when you join that. But you know what? It's so funny. You might have everything else in your world right, but you've got this friend. And I must be honest, some people who are gossipers are sometimes the funnest friends. Have you noticed that? They're like fun personalities. Ah, yeah, and you have a great time. And then all of a sudden, hey, did you know? Did you know? Oh, <laughs> no, I didn't know. But I leave a little bit of doubt in your mind about that person dangerous, so dangerous, so subtle, isn't it? So dangerous. Refuse gossip because it is a spiritual force that can attach itself to you. You are responsible for what you hear and say. And if you don't uh, rearrange your life and have positive people around you, you will be complicit in whatever gossip is going on. So it's a spiritual force. It will hinder your spiritual growth like nothing else. That in the spirit of offense, you will not be able to grow anymore. You will be stunted. And then you get frustrated, and then you start backsliding, and you're losing faith, and, oh, God's not for me anymore. Oh, yeah, but did, did you gossip? I've, we have run a church for over 20 years. We have seen people who gossip, they get sick. It opens the door to, to sickness. So <laughs> I hate to labor the point. But it's so important to know because if I don't tell you, how will you know? We've seen it over the years in other people's church, whatever. You can see it in the workplace. I haven't just worked in churches. I've worked for non-for-profit organizations. And you're blessed if you get an amazing team and an amazing boss. But if you're in a team that gossips, oh, man, it's a hard day. (laughs) 
And as a Christian, you understand the ramifications for that. So I'm going to leave it there, but please think about that. Make a commitment to, make, to making your church a healthy environment. Now, I want to talk about something else that most people, I don't know, maybe pastors do talk about it, but what if you need to leave your church? How do you do that? How do you do it well? Most Christians don't know. And so they leave their churches and their pastor's like gutted, doesn't know where they've gone, known them for 20 years, and suddenly they're just gone in the shopping center. They're like, you're like, ah, hi, and they're like not talking to you. <laughs> you don't know why. Tell your pastor, if your season is up, man up, woman up, and say, you know what? I'm going to tell my pastor in love that I'm moving on. I'm going to thank them. I'm going to thank them for praying for me when I didn't know they were praying for me. I'm going to thank them and say, this is why I'm leaving. But I love you. Will you release me? And a good pastor, a healthy leader will say, yes, thank you for coming to tell me I release you in Jesus' name. You need to be released from a church because you make a spiritual commitment to a place and then you just like move into the shadows, you're gone. <sighs> Who's your covering? My responsibility is over you and you're not there. So you're going to get the phone calls that you keep like ignoring. You might get an email. Do you know why? <clears throat> because you are our responsibility spiritually. We cover and protect you. So we worry about you. We don't see you for three or four weeks. And it's happened to us. We've known people for 20 years and they just left. Nothing. That's okay. We still love them. Still going to say hi to them at Woolies. <laughs> but it would have been so much better if they just said, hey, our season's changing. This is why. Thank you so much. Will you release us? Yes, we release you. That is a, an excellent way to leave a church. Most of the time, people leave churches because they're moving geographically. And then we, you know, we, at the end of the service, when everyone's having coffee with the pastoral team, we'll come around that family or that individual and we will pray for them and we release them spiritually so that they are untethered to now find a new covering in a new place. Leave well. If you're going to leave a church, do it right. Because you have a responsibility to do it right. I'm sorry this is uncomfortable for some of you, I know. But it's good to hear it, right? Leave right. Because you never know you might want to come back one day. <laughs> so you want the doors to be, you want to feel an ease and a flow that you can just walk back in. And you'll be welcomed and loved as if you never left. Because you did it right. And the spirit between you was sweet. Don't hang on out of obligation. If your heart is getting yucky and blah towards the leadership of that church, leave quickly. But do it right. Just talk to them. Because the longer you stay and the longer it festers in your heart, the, the harder the exchange is going to be like, we need to go. Now, if you have really unhealthy leadership, this could be hard because they won't make it easy for you. But that's a sign to you that you're doing the right thing. <laughs> leave well, because the way you leave is going to determine your spiritual blessing in the next place. And if you haven't done it well, you can send a card if you want to your pastor, or you can repent. Whatever God leads you, you might not have to do any of that, but you've got to do it right. Because your spiritual blessing is actually in tied in with how you leave somewhere. You've got to leave well. Same with the workplace. It's better to leave well, right? Even if it's difficult, it's under the grace of God. You go and you say, my time is up, but thank you for whatever. Okay? Tell others. If you've got friends and, you know, people talk about leaving churches, coming to churches all the time. Pass on this information. That would be amazing. I think pastors would really appreciate it because we release people in love and then everything's clear. There's no questions. Does that make sense? And so being part of a family of God, you do have a responsibility in that family, but your pastor has a massive responsibility over you. You know, my dad, when, when I was ordained, 
he said to me, do you understand the charge? And I said, yes, I understand. He said, do you understand the charge? (laughs) What you preach, how you treat people, you're going to be held doubly accountable in heaven according to the scriptures as someone who is not a leader in a church. And I tell you, I get goosebumps now. I live with that. I wish more ministers lived with that. And it pains me when I see any congregation members being badly treated by other pastors in other churches, maybe just flippant or rude. It hurts. It hurts me. I want to cry, (laughs) scream. Don't you know these people are precious? They are God's people. They are made in the image of God. How you treat them matters. They are not just here to serve your needs. They are here to grow into their full potential. And so finding healthy leadership is so important. If you know that you're not in a church that you can trust the leadership, that is a clear sign to you. You need to get out. Okay? Because the family of God is never going to be perfect. No one's family is perfect. Hey, no matter where you grow up, your natural family, no one's perfect. But there are levels of like health and toxicity, right? <laughs> if, if you're in a church that values the people, my dad is always to we value the people, then you're in a, a better place than someone who's just using the people for their end game, for their end means. And you've got to be smart enough to know the difference. Amen. And even, even if you are under bad leadership, I'm talking to people out there. You still have to honor the process of telling your pastor you're leaving. Does that make sense? Because that's not on them. That's on you. As long as you do your part right, you can walk clean and you can walk free because how you behaved was godly and it sets you free. And I really believe God honors that. And I really believe God, you know, really blesses that. So when you are part of a church family, it is a commitment but it is a joy, and it is, um, I would say, it should be a great comfort to you to know that you're part of a church where people love you and pray for you, where people serve alongside of you, where you get to grow in the things of God, where you get to be touched by the power of the Holy Spirit. So important, that balance. And you know what brings the balance every single time? It's the Word of God. The Word of God brings the balance. You must have the engagement with the things of the Spirit. But it can't be, woo, two or two out there that nobody actually knows the Scriptures. This is our safety net, our foundation. It gives all of us the roadmap to life, how to engage in our community, how to be part of the kingdom at, at large. There is a lot of instruction in here for pastors. There is a lot of instruction in here for parishioners, for congregation members. And so when all of those things, when there's a balance and you have good leadership, it's a safe place to be. Amen. So I just wanted to um, speak that today. And I was like, Lord, I was not expecting to speak all of that today. I don't know why, but I believe it's really for somebody. Even if you're out there and you're listening, um, I really believe that something that just needs to be said, because then you know. Amen. Um, I actually wanted to do something today. I, I wanted everyone just to stand up, grab a few people around you, and I just wanted you to be the body of Christ and pray for whoever's around you. Doesn't have to be anything wrong, nothing wrong, if you just want to pray an encouraging word. So maybe in groups of five or six, Just choose one of the people in that group and just pray for them and be the body of Christ to someone else in your your sphere. Dom, if I could have Dom, or if we could just play some music, that'd be great. Sorry, Dom. We've got um, a family up the back who needs some people. Okay, awesome. Be the body of Christ. Pray, strengthen, encourage right now. Thank you, Lord.
All right, keep praying. Just a short one. Encouragement. Be the body of Christ. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your peace now. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Awesome. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hopefully you're feeling encouraged. The body of Christ at work. The body of Christ at work doing the ministry. Amen. How good is it to pray for each other? Church, be blessed. We'll see you on Good Friday. Don't forget to come. It's just 9.30. We'll have tea and coffee and some nibbles afterwards. But we can't wait to see you at our communion service on Friday. Be blessed.